Okay, so just a, a brief overview of the course, a very short course, only three days. And yesterday we did some pretty, um, uh, uh, okay, uh, an introduction to bioenergetics. Okay, today I will say a couple of things about the energetics of cellular systems. And tomorrow I will probably give a more standard research talk, but since it's so long, I'll try to be uh, pedagogical. And I thought we could, we could start with a, a small recap of what happened yesterday. Right? As always, you're all welcome to ask questions. Yesterday, many people ask questions. It's okay, don't worry about time. I, I have the time there so I can you know, shut you up. That's very easy. <laughs> so don't, you know, don't, don't just go ahead. Uh, so we first started with some uh, 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 digressions on, on why we, we should study or why it could be interesting to study biological energetics, right? And we said it began by, by what I refer to as a, a radio E. coli correspondence. Uh, that we should think so about E. coli as we think about radios. <laughs> and together with some notions of energetics, that means that um, we can expect to have trends like this in which the function of a cellular system or somehow the whole cell relates to dissipation in some manner, maybe increasing such that there are, we can study properties of this, of this function. And we talked a lot about what this means, right? So how this cannot be a general result because of course uh, there will be what function is is rather arbitrary right? so you define different function you get different different uh, relation but still it can be informative to study the asymptotics the scaling right the other thing we're talking about is that dissipation is not really a, a control parameter right so it won't give you full microscopic insight you can't directly control the dissipation just like in a radio right you you can control the resistance of a wire, right? And that will affect how much it heats up. You can control the properties of, you know, different chemical properties of your battery and that will affect it, right? You don't, don't control entropy production directly. So that's a, the, the good and the bad of, of bioenergetics, I would say. And then what we did is we, we went to do some pretty brutal uh, biological, uh, bioenergetic estimates, right? And we, we talked a lot about it and we discussed, it was a lot of fun. And several of you came afterwards to tell me why what I was doing was wrong, which was, <laughs> which was very good. Uh, I insist yeah, <laughs> that we, we, we came to the conclusion that a human radiates 10 to the four uh, per kilogram as the sun. This is a sort of pop culture number that many people repeat, but, but I think it's, it's, it's rather accurate based on measurements. So today I, I, I sent some references to Sue. I don't know if you share them, including a paper that I found last night where and it was a review on, on, on heat production of, of, of humans, which is itself not a trivial thing to measure, right? Because there's as many definitions, like there's some that require the human to be laying in bed and very, very calm and not having eaten for 12 hours, you know? So it depends on all these things, right? And then we also talked about uh, the relationship between the, the biosphere dissipation and the general radiation from the earth. And here again, you know, Massimiliano was explaining me how is a better way of doing it than what I did it, which I think it's, it's very, very interesting. Uh, so th this number is probably off. <laughs> And the, the third one, we, I was, uh, we did some very, very crude estimate of the entropy of, of formation, if you want, of uh, biomass. And we, we said that is, you know, this is a, a repeated calculation due to um, um, Harold Morowitz. And then I, I you know, we, we, it seemed like the number was roughly what people are measuring, but again, this is a very difficult number to measure. And one thing that I forget to send you is references with these measurements, which I, I can send if you're interested. Okay, all right, so that was yesterday. Any doubts on everything that we talked? If not, maybe after you read, yeah. Yesterday we did the entropy. We did the entropy of biomass. This yeah. is not the entropy. This is not the entropy, oh, okay. So this is, a, this is a free energy probably. This is a free energy, which is enthalpy plus entropy. So the entropy is a small contribution to that. It's about maybe one kilojoule per gram or two kilojoules per gram. Um, two, two, two kilojoules. Joules? Kilojoules, joules. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> it's recorded, so you know. Um, um, and today, I've, I've, the, the structure is going to be. I'm just going to give a small review of cellular systems, right, and with a bit of digression on the energetic principles. And then, I want to give you some some simple example of energy transduction, in particular of mechanochemical uh, transduction. So originally, I wasn't going to do that, but I, I read a. I was reading a. A couple of days ago, a very nice uh, thermodynamics uh, book that Jonathan recommended to me, and and I had it on my Kindle, and and you know it explains in a very very simple matter manner uh, this topic. So, so I thought maybe it's worth going over it. Okay. 
Um, so I, I think there's many different ways of understanding um, a cell, right? And I'm here I'm going to discuss about three different views of a cell and give a bit of bioenergetic context. So one way of understanding cells, which we heard a lot about, well, Jonathan has told us a bit about all of them, right? So, so I, I come already with a, a lot of work done, but it's, I think it's good to repeat things a little bit for, for clarity, right? And one way of understanding cells is, is metabolism, right? And Jonathan today was saying, I'm, I'm not sure how much we've talked about respiration. So I thought, you know, we can still say one more time. <laughs> so one, uh, uh, especially for the physicists, like uh, whenever we hear these words, if you're not used to them, sound very alien. So one way of understanding a, a, a very simple metabolic pathway, which is cellular respiration of glucose by uh, bacteria, say, is a bacteria will consume oxygen and glucose and they will do some magic to it, so several chemical reactions. And these chemical reactions are the set of these first chemical reactions is referred to as glycolysis. And from these chemical reactions, what happens is that two ATPs, two net ATPs are produced. Okay. And I'm simplifying everything very much. If you have serious, you know, not very serious doubts, please ask me. If they're very serious, then you can ask Jonathan probably. <laughs> Um, then after that, the, the, what happens is that another uh, very famous metabolic pathway gets activated. Right? So when you see metabolic networks, they look like a mess, but there's often some circle. Right? So that circle is the TCA cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle. Right? So just so you know, you hear these words are also known as the Krebs cycle. So when you hear these words, they're all uh, interchangeable. And from this very complicated set of chemical reactions, what effectively happens is that um, electrons uh, go to the electron transport chain. I know that sounds like magic. I mean, of course, it's, it's much more intricate. NADH goes, interacts, and so on. But what, what you have is that effectively, um, there's ele an electron passing through several complexes that Jonathan was showing today, right? Which have this very non-original uh, name of complex one, complex two, complex three, complex four, right? <laughs> and I don't know who <laughs> came up with that. And as the electron is passing by, right? So there's like an, an, a little wire inside the cell. Right? So it's really like an, a little wire. And these complexes are on the membrane. What happens is that protons are getting pushed out, right? Also known as hydrogen ions, right? This proton sounds so disturbing. Um, and so after you push the protons out, this all seems a bit wasteful because what you want in the end is very complicated. What you want to do is, is get ATP, right? And there's profound reasons that, that Jonathan went over, right? That, uh, or, or soon the other member, but why you want to break it down into little steps. It's, uh, Eventually, this uh, beautiful thing happens is that the, the, the protons come back in. Okay, they come back in, and they come back in uh, through a particular protein assembly. This protein assembly is called the ATP synthase because it synthesizes ATP. Okay. And, and, and this is one hell of a machine because with, with, with you know, all, well, here you just produce two, here you produce around 30, right? And with the ATP synthase rotating very, very, very fast. And so understanding how this works Okay, this is called chemiosmosis theory. Question, yeah. Okay, can you talk a bit louder, please? Or use a microphone, <laughs> I don't hear you well. This is a beautiful but huge room, so it's... Okay, um, so here is a I coli cell. cell. E. coli, you mean? E. coli, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so uh, I was wondering because in eukaryotic cells, um, if when you are creating like uh, electrons transport and proton gradient, then so the proton gradient will will be regulated. So at the end, we can also regulate like ATP production. So the mitochondria will be regulated with the by the cytoplasmic. Uh, um, like um, if you have a lot of protons in the cytoplasm, then it will affect the way that uh, so some kind of proton protein. homeostasis. Yeah, that's yeah. it. But so I was wondering for the bacteria, so for the E. coli, e. coli then um, maybe the, the <laughs> external environment will more regulate this process. So how so how, how this cell can be can diminish like the effect of external environment. So, so you mean, uh, uh, how does, uh, I mean, it's a very good question to which I don't have a very good answer. There may be a very good answer, I just probably like the expertise. <clears throat> so the, the, there's a proton gradient, right? There's a, there's a, there's a charge gradient. And I, uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, equal has several different types of, of, of channels to, to transport ions. And that's how I would regulate this gradient, but definitely changing the pH conditions where the cell growth will very much affect its, 
um, growth rate and presumably also it's it's uh, the rate as, at which this happens but beyond that i don't know where well to take but maybe somebody else can i don't know good enough my answer <laughs> and so uh, will you say that um like uh, ion, ion channels will be will have different regulation mode if you compare to mitochondria so the short answer is I'm not I don't know much about, about mitochondria but, but but in some sense I think always a, a mitochondria is very similar to to a E. coli right so it's it's a it's just an oversimplification but it's some kind of bacteria which is itself keeping uh, this, yeah. this homeostasis but the things that seems tricky is that um, so mitochondria is like inside of the cell so then the membrane the cell membrane will also aid, help to regulate the the proton homeostasis where where in the bacterial environment you cannot do that so there is a right, two so layer of regulation yeah, i see what you're saying you're saying that in in a, in a eukaryote you have two levels of regulating the ph right one is the the, the cytoplasm of the eukaryote the other is the cytoplasm of, of the mitochondria whereas here you only have one way of regulating it which is the bacteria itself right so i uh, i think i agree with that but i i cannot comment much more than, than what I said, I think. Maybe somebody else can, I don't know. Just want to clarify, yeah. so uh, this if this is an E. coli cell, so does the electron transport chain happen at the membrane itself? I'm not sure, I mean. Yes, it happens uh, at the membrane, as far as I know. I see. So the, right, 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 uh, the, the first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it has, yes, E. coli has two membranes, and this is the, the, the inner membrane. Uh, I see. Okay, okay. Right, and the reason that you need to have, a, I mean, that was one of the great discoveries was coupling the production of ATP with uh, the membrane, right? Understanding that it is because you create, essentially what you're doing is you're taking chemical energy, right, in form of glucose, you're transforming it into an electrical potential by pushing protons out, and then you're transforming it again into chemical energy. The form of ATP, right? So electricity is some kind of intermediary. Yeah, but I would imagine you can still change the pH of the outer environment and, and, and I, I, In the, in the, so I, I could imagine that's true, but I don't know, I cannot say much more. Okay, so this is metabolism that I didn't want to say much about. <laughs> um, um, but it is more or less clear, right? So I think the, the main idea for me as a, as a physicist that doesn't know much biochemistry is that you have uh, glucose and oxygen, you make a little bit of ATP there, then you transform it into a proton gradient, and then protons come back up, back in, and in that way you pro produce a lot of ATP, right? Um, and CO2 and water comes out. <laughs> then the, the, the other way of understanding, uh, of seeing a cells at a global scale is as information processing devices. Okay, and, in, and again, I'm just gonna talk about uh, E. coli type of deal. And here the idea is that you have different types of receptors, right? so you can have uh, chemical receptors, temperature re receptors, uh, uh, pH uh, as well. And um, um, these this, this receptors will, in the case of chemical receptors that will bind to some ligand, right? And that will create some kind of conformational change in the receptor itself. And then that will <clears throat> result, oh, oops, sorry, ultimately in a, an interaction with what's often referred to as response regulators. Okay, so you have a first layer with many different types of receptors, a couple of few dozen, I think maybe 30, 40, or that, that order of magnitude. And then you have other four, you know, 40, 50 different response uh, regulators. Okay, and these guys will talk with these guys. And it's not a trivial mapping. It's maybe not as complex as in eukaryotes, right? but it's not exactly one and one. Uh, it's not completely entangled either. There's something in between. And then what typically happens is that these response regulators are also transcript, uh, transcription factors, okay? and therefore they will bind to DNA, and they will enable the, the activation of a gene, and then the gene gets transcribed. Right? So when we've done that, what we've done is we've transformed, we've gone from the world of proteins, right, which ha is written in a, 20 letter code to the world of uh, nucleic acids, which is within a four letter alphabet. Okay? 
Uh, here are some numbers, uh, the kind of standard numbers for, for E. coli on the, uh, that, that you can uh, find. And um, then this, the, the, in the last step is you have this mRNA will uh, fold and form into a protein, no? and therefore uh, completing this cycle. And then this protein can do different things, can be a feedback, it can uh, affect the, the receptors themselves. Right? And this whole process is powered by energy consumption. Right? So, of course, transcription costs energy, translation costs energy, and, 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 and so on. Right? And phosphorylation of the receptors costs energy, so energy transaction is coupled also to information processing, right? Just like in metabolism, producing energy also costs you energy. Right? Sorry, can I just ask a question real quick? Yeah, I'm right. not, yeah. How, how do the response regulators interact with the DNA? How do response regulators interact with the DNA? So the response regulators are transcription factors, they bind to DNA, and when they bind to DNA, they allow, um, they can allow or forbid uh, polymerase to bind to DNA and to transcribe a particular gene into messenger RNA. Are these things like histone proteins? Or so this is E. coli, so it doesn't have uh, histones. It's just like little, normally, tetra four, you know, tetramers that they, as they will assemble. And when they bind there, they can bind another thing called the sigma factor, which mediates between the, the response regulator and the polymerase. The polymerase binds and then transcribes. And uh, I would say the, 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 the third question of, um, and the third way in which you can understand uh, cells is from a more mechanical point of view. Okay, so cells also do uh, mechanical work. I mean, normally it uh, will be dissipated into the, the surrounding fluid right away, right? Because they, they move the flagella and whatever. And I wanted to go to, through some examples of the different type of motors that exist in a cell. These don't exist in E. coli, okay? So kinesis is not an E. coli motor, but I put inside this egg thing to not disrupt the, the transparency symmetry, <laughs> but just so you know. So kinesin, not in E. coli. Um, uh, so kinesin is a type of, uh, so how many of you have heard about molecular motors before? Uh, please, with the hands. Okay, so we're gonna fly through this, right? So kinesin is a motor that you probably all see in the movies, right? It just walks, consumes ATP and moves forward. And there's also myosin that uh, uh, is responsible for muscle contraction, right? And as kinesin, these are both fueled by ATP. Um, but in E. coli, you don't have these guys. What you have is uh, uh, the bacteriophageal motor. No? So how many of you have heard about the bacteriophageal motor? OK, so less, but still, still quite a few people. No? So the bacteriophageal motor, unlike these motors, is powered by protons. And it's a rotary motor. OK, so it spins very, very fast. And <clears throat> as it spins, what it does is it curls this, this cilium in a, in a particular way. Right? And that creates a certain, a certain, certain shape that is favorable. Oh, sorry, I said cilium, this flagella in a particular way. And so that creates a, a propulsion of the cell. Right? And there's a whole uh, uh, story on how, uh, on the hydrodynamics of this system. Right? So, so this is a world of hydrodynamics and mechanics and such things. Right? Now, what's interesting is, of course, these are not uh, isolated uh, descriptions of the cell and they talk to each other. And a lot of the work, in, including my work, not that it was too relevant in the field, but you know, I've also worked on that. It has to do with the uh, transduction of information into this type of mechanical work, right? And I think Alberto Sassi is also an expert on human taxes, so you can ask him. Maybe, <laughs> as, maybe not an expert. He's an expert, so you can ask him all about it. <laughs> and and the idea is that um, um, you know you 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 swim, right? So cells swim, but they swim to 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 do something, right? And in particular, they swim to to um, they respond to chemicals. Okay? I won't say they swim to get food, you know, that would be a simplification, but they respond to chemical cues. And <clears throat> there's a whole history on, on the how information is transduced from the environment, okay, from chemical signals into motion, okay? And how this information processing little module uh, allows the cell to behave in a way that is, that is favorable for, for growth. Okay? So to swim towards regions where growth is more favorable, okay? And, and fun fact, although this is, so this is probably the best studied, so this type of systems are called two component systems in bacteria, okay, where you have a, a receptor and a response regulator. There's a kinase, kinase normally, it was not important, so they're called two component systems, you have these two, so for each of these guys in the membrane, there's another guy here, and typically they bind to um, DNA, right? So the best studied two component system is probably 
bacterial chemotaxis, which is, however, an exception, because it doesn't bind to DNA. In this case, it binds to the motor, okay? And, and that would result uh, in, in motion, in motion, informed motion, let's say. Do you guys have any, any questions about bacterial chemotaxis? We can talk more about it uh, on the break if you want, so, so that's something that I, I could more or less. Um, and if I have any doubt, I can ask Alberto, so it's fine. Um, okay, so let's do a bit more and then maybe we can do a two minute break. Yes, I just wanna show you a, a final movie of, of, um, of um, how cells can do mechanical work because I think it's, it's quite informative, okay? And the kind of things you can see. So, so far I've talked about single motors, okay, so that they all consume either ATP or uh, use a proton gradient. Same proton gradient they use for the ATP synthase, right? Which is also in the same cell, which is also a rotary motor. Okay? Same proton gradient can also power uh, uh, the swimming of uh, E. coli. So those are single motors, okay? But there's also uh, systems, uh, natural systems, in which you have many motors together. For example, in muscles, you have many motors together, right? You don't have one uh, myosin, you have myosin. You have fibers with a lot, a lot of myosin. One, uh, case that I particularly like is the, of this type of collective motion is on a eukaryotic cell, which is depicted here. This is chlamydomonas. It's, it's an algae. That's, that's why it's green, right? And uh, it's actually green, of course. And chlamydomonas has two uh, cilia, which are also sometimes called flagella, which should not be confused with the flagella from prokaryotes. Completely different, different beast, right? Completely different beast. So just so you know a bit the, 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 the fauna that is out there. The flora, I guess. And um, uh, so you see uh, the, uh, within this structure, okay, unlike in the case of the flagella of E. coli, you have uh, thousands and thousands of molecular motors. Okay, so, so E. coli has one motor at the base. This has, I forget the number now, but it must be like on the order of 10,000 or something like that, if not more. Um, and, and of course, therefore, this structure is active, right? So it consumes a lot of energy, right? It's not one motor, it's, it's, it's a huge number of motors. But what's interesting is that all these, how these motors are regulated in order for the cell to swim, right? Who tells each motor what to do so that the, 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 the you know, the, the, the cilium swims the right way, right? It doesn't just twitch, right? So in the case of E. coli, there was a signaling network regulating the, the motion uh, of the single motor, right? That swims one way or another, it would change the shape of the cilium, right? So, uh, the flagella, <laughs> the flagella of E. coli only has two shapes, essentially, right? So it has the shape when the motor is rotating clockwise, the shape when it rotates counterclockwise. In this case, uh, the, 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 the story is very different because in fact, you can, you can remove uh, the, the cilium from the, from, the, from the cell body, okay? Not with scissors, but with, you know, say molecular biology scissors. And you can then add detergent so that the membrane that surrounds the, the, the cilium is, is, uh, di disappears, let's say, it goes away. And then you can also add uh, energy, right? Chemical energy in the form of ATP. And the kind of things that you obtain are, is this. Right? So I show it because it's, it's very beautiful. This is a, mo a movie made by, by, a, by a friend of mine, Vico, in, in back in the days when we were in Dresden. Um, but what's important about this movie is that the, the, the motion is, is uh, very ordered. Okay, so this is a different type of regulation. Okay, I told you that the motion of the flagella can be regulated by um, a signaling cascade in the case of, of um, E. coli. Here, the, this very ordered motion is regulated mechanically. You have many motors along the cilium. They all talk to each other just for mechanics because right now there's no brain, right? <laughs> there's no signaling system. There's just a, a lot of motors coupled together. So it's a bit like uh, uh, um, if everybody starts walking, sort of pushing each other, and somehow you figure out the right solution, you start moving collectively. But just in this case, this collective motion happens to be a wave, right? And you can analyze this wave, and it's very, very similar to the type of waves that you have uh, in the intact cell when it swims. Okay, now, yeah, question. So uh, they are maintaining a really ordered uh, movement, right? So if you can see, I think in the, the center might be like they're maintaining the center of mass as well. So is it 
uh, is there a reason why they are following such a ordered uh, movement as in uh, this sort of preserves a lot of energy to not shift the location and just go round because if you follow the structure of a red line green line or black line it's a very symmetric structure so the probably the center is being maintained somehow by the organism so that is for a reason uh, that's the first question the second question is if there were other organisms also like other uh, few other see you know organisms beside it would that sort of uh, influence the way it would move or okay, so, 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 so let me try to ask uh, um, both questions so the first question uh, has to do with uh, how, uh, why it is so ordered and as well as why is it asymmetric and um, what about the center of mass right okay so these are like three questions uh, about the center of mass so so when you have uh, uh, something swimming in a fluid at um, very small scale, right? So when, when something of this size moving this fast, so this moves very fast, this moves at around 100 hertz, okay? So something uh, uh, of that scale, uh, but it's only 10, yeah, I didn't put even scale, but this 10 microns, more or less in, size, in length, okay? So when you have something of 10 microns swimming, uh, moving uh, uh, at around 100 hertz, you're in a regime that in, in hydrodynamics is called low Reynolds number regime. When you're at the lower, uh, in the lower nose number regime, the total forces and torques that you are exerting in the fluid will have to balance because it's not going to be uh, inertia or, 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 or things like that propagated to the fluid. And because of that, uh, the, you, you will have some points that behave like, like you said. About why is it asymmetric? It's asymmetric because, um, okay, why? No, again, why and whatever. It is asymmetric, period. But <laughs> one, one fact is that the, um, uh, in the in, so I didn't show a movie of the of how the cell actually swims, but the cell swims with a, what you could call a, a breaststroke motion. I okay? guess so it does like this essentially. So to do like this, this arm needs to needs to uh, move asymmetrically. So what's happening here is that you just cut the body, and so the arm is sort of doing like this, right? So it's trying to swim and doesn't go anywhere, which is a great advantage for imaging because since this happens very fast and you need a quite high magnification, if it's not asymmetric, it's a goes away, you don't see it anymore. <laughs> because it's asymmetric, it swims in circles and it stays there, right? In the cell, however, the asymmetry of one is compensated with the asymmetry of the other and the cell swims forward. I uh, sort of misunderstood the center of mass because the center is creating the star, the black star. If you... Oh, well, well, so that's not the center, of, that's just the, the center of the, of the, of the, that's just the center of- Center of the organism. I mean, yeah, the, well, this is not an organism, but this is just a cilia. Yeah. yeah, I mean, sorry, center yeah. of the cilia. So uh, that is making the black star, right? So that center is not constant. No. Yeah, okay. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. So on average, the motion will have a, a fixed point. But, and you can show very easily that just take, you know, you can take the waveforms and predict the trajectory swimming just using basic hydrodynamics and lower north number. And everything much is very, so this is one of those things that much, Things match very well, not just classic uh, biophysics, so things work quite well. Yeah, yeah, another question. This fiber. How motors are arranged in this fiber? Aha, this is a very good question. <laughs> I mean, I can talk a lot about this because I did my PhD on, on this topic. So. <laughs> so I was just showing it as a, but um, okay, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try to be uh, brief. Uh, so this is a cross section of the of the um, the cilium, right? And it has um, uh, microtubules, right? So microtubules are like these uh, rods. Okay, so it has nine. <clears throat> I'm gonna simplify a bit. It has nine uh, microtubules that give it stability. <clears throat> it has two um, other microtubules here, okay, and then some kind of structures connecting it like this, such that the host system doesn't collapse. That's what people think, okay? This is not very, <clears throat> people are only now starting to be able to do a cry em on, 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 on these structures, okay? So it's not perfect. Um, and then the motors are connected like this, okay? So funny enough, right? So they're connected, um, they're actually shearing the structure. They're not active, directly bending, they're shearing it. Right? So if these are the silly, the, the, the microtubules, thank you. Then they're doing the motors are doing okay. The motors are doing this, right? So they're shearing it. What happens is there's constraints to that shearing, 
So eventually the shearing is released, transforming into bending of the whole structure. And then um, that bending causes the motors to detach and stop pushing. And then the motors on the other side will engage and we push the other way. And then they will disengage and the ones above engage and so on. It's a quite a, <laughs> it's, a it's a beautiful system. Yeah, more questions, yeah. 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 How long so how long did this behavior continue given that you were providing ATP externally? Yeah. Because as when it is attached to the uh, body of the organism, cilia, there are a lot more biological processes taking place. And when you cut it out and let it just free yeah. in the uh, environment mm -hmm. and you're providing ATP from outside, it's just that the motors have are getting the energy to do this kind of uh, work. But for how long did this continue if you uh, okay. kept observing it? So, so the question is, how long do you, can, you, can this motion persist given that it's not somehow um, regulated or babysitted by the, by the whole cell body, right? So, so I would answer with just one question. What, what is your background? Are you a physicist or biologist? Physicist, physicist but... right? So that, that's what I asked, but of course, it, nobody wanted to do the experiment. <laughs> Um, uh, we don't know. We only tried for one hour. Um, so up to one hour, we, we've seen it, right? I mean, if it were me doing it, I would just let the thing run with an ATP regeneration system until forever, right, to see what happens. But, um, <laughs> but you know, uh, because we, we know this needs to be, this is regulated in the cell, right? So in the cell, there's active. I mean, like here, I just showed there's a little mechanical oscillator, special spatial temporal oscillator, but in reality, it's a very, messy business, right? So that you have molecular motors walking up and down these tracks uh, to uh, regenerate and adjust the length of the of the cilia, right? So this, uh, this is a, there's like hundreds of proteins just dedicated to this thing, you know? And, uh, and uh, so there's length control and, and presumably also maintenance of other aspects. One hour or even a bit longer, we've seen it. But I mean, it's also difficult. It's not a trivial experiment, right? Because you need to have a very stable ATP regenerating system for a very long time. You know, this is not like, this is small, right? So it, it's not getting to this and with this quality of images, this is not um, trivial. So eventually it will stop. Um... No, I expect that eventually things will break apart. Break up. So the, the, the you know, the microtubules, I guess that they will, they will Right, some motors, but, you know, then that's what degrade would, probably degrade yes. something will unfold. But, but I, I think in general, the as I talk with Simon, sometimes the, how things break is not something we understand very well in, in biology. I so, I had a question. So, uh, do we have any information about what the medium was? Because I'm interested in how the like you mentioned it's a lower energy number medium. Yeah. So, uh, do we? expect a change in the kind of motion if we use a more viscous material, let's say, in the medium, because uh, you are providing the energy. So maybe either it's moving like to maximizing its entropy or it's preserving the energy it has. Like, right, okay, so the question is, well, how, how does viscosity play a role? Yeah. yeah. Right, so so um, you see that, the, the, um, I mean, you know, <laughs> I can give you just a talk about this as well. <laughs> The, so it's interesting, right? So and, and we, we we play with that. So we change the viscosity by by adding uh, different chemicals to the to the to the media, and it's not as it's not as trivial as one would expect because in fact the motion it's it's a self-organized property. So there's like an emergent frequency, um, and the, somehow the system si seems to adjust. So I think what you would expect is that the as you reduce the viscosity, the frequency would go up because it's like less resistance, but in fact, it stays more or less uh, constant because what selects the frequency, it's a, at the physics level, it's a complicated interaction between the, the you know, somehow the unstable modes of this mechanical system. Okay. okay. More questions. <laughs> No, I'm just interested. So show this movie, then everybody's entertained for one hour. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm just curious to know it's that uh, does when it's connected to the body of the algae, uh, does the algae, you know, give instruction to the cilia to move in a particular direction, or the cilia has the sensory, uh, you know, uh, proteins to guide the algae? So how, which way does it happen? Right. So 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 okay. So so first, cilia. So cilia are interesting structures themselves. So they're used also for um, uh, you know, like 
tra transmit information uh, uh, across, uh, from cell to cell. But for, you know, as far as I'm talking about them now, the answer to your question is, they are regulated by the cell, okay? The, uh, but in a, in a very subtle way. So essentially, the cell has, it says if you have these walking legs, uh, you know, that always walk attached to you, so you just have to steer a little, a little bit, right? And it does so in response, presumably to many things, but one particularly relevant one is light, right? So this is an algae, so it needs light to grow, but not too much light, you know, so it does phototaxis. And there's a whole uh, funny business of, so it has a, a, an eye, let's say, you know, so it has receptors for, for photons, and there's a whole interesting story of the, you know, how you couple the, the motion, it's a, it's a helical motion for the cell, and so how you couple the motion of the cell with the, with the, with the light and, and so on. Okay, last last question. <laughs> we we'll move on. Again. Just just follow uh, <clears throat> following up from what she asked. So, I just see my computer thinks it's too long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, here, if you were to provide a particular sensory input, let's say let's say light or something, would you expect it to sort of you know navigate, or would that be only would that only happen if you had the cell? Because here, what I see is that it's it's in the same position. It's just beating around. So can you repeat this again? Yeah. So I'm saying that in in the movie, it's it sort of appears that it's 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 just beating around in the same position. Yeah. But if you were to provide a sensory input, let's say light, would you expect it to move? The psyllium. Yeah, in the absence of the cell. So the, you mean to move? Not in a circle, but directionally. Yeah, no, yeah. no, I wouldn't. No, no, no. So these are the, that's like the core of of, of the cilium. Right? This is the, what's called the axonym, so the, the the inside of the of the cilium. And uh, I don't think anybody has checked, but I doubt my experience will know it would respond to light. Okay, so my my slides disappear, but uh, that's okay because I only have two two more slides that were not very important anyways, and like this we we gain some time. <laughs> Uh, what I thought I would do um, now in the time that I have left is give you some flavor. Okay, I don't want to. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to go too much into details, but I give you some flavor on how you can you can do some modeling of this um, uh, mechanochemical transduction. Okay, how you can model this. Start. I will think so. Well, the other day we managed to get pretty, pretty far. <laughs> um, okay, so the idea is we have seen molecular motors, right? We've discussed a little bit, very little about kinesine and uh, you know, a bit about the fragile motors and, and, and a lot about the, the, the axonym. And, and after you know, the talk, my talk is over, you're welcome to ask me more about the axonym because that's something that I feel more or less comfortable with and it's 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 easy to talk about and I have slides and movies and whatever. So again, um, but today I'm just gonna show you a very simple way of of modeling. Um, of get, I mean, I wouldn't even say modeling is of saying some something about how uh, hydrolyzing ATP relates to a motor performing work, right? mechanical work. What we saw is mechanical work that is then dissipated into the fluid, right? But, but this kind of things. Okay. So we have a box. And like always in thermodynamics, it all starts with a box. And uh, in the box, there's a, a chunk of muscle, okay? The muscle fibers, okay? And we want to describe, um, um, we're gonna also put other things like, look, we have colors, we're gonna do colors. Okay, so we have, um, Let's say this is ATP, and we also have um, ADP, and we also have um, inorganic, inorganic phosphate, okay? And so um, what I would like you to, so ATP, ADP, MPI. Okay, so we're gonna write the, 
an expression for the free energy of the system, okay? And the first thing we need to do is describe what are the variables that this free energy will depend on, okay? So imagine this is in constant, you know, in an open vessel, uh, in constant, so we can do like this, in constant with the, with the environment, the room environment. The first question is, what, what are we gonna put as variables, right? So the first one is very easy. Uh, who wants to tell me the first one? Is the one that if you tell your, your, your mom or your dad, you work on something about energetics and thermodynamics, they'll tell you, ah, temperature. Right? So temperature, that's a very good one. Uh, the other one is also very easy. A bit louder so I can hear it. Somebody said it. Pressure, pressure, right? And uh, we also have to have something describing the characteristics of this thing, okay, which we're gonna call the, the length. And uh, the, the amount of, of, this, of these different chemicals that we're putting here. So they say, let's say NT for ATP and uh, D, no, so D for ADP and P for inorganic phosphate, okay? Wow, I've really scaled up the font size for the. <laughs> um, and what we wanna do, and, and oh, I think Massimilia will go over next week very carefully over all, all of this. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you a very sketchy version, right? So probably you'll have to forget everything so you learn it properly next week. <laughs> Um, but we want to discuss how does the, the free energy change uh, over time. Okay, so little dot, time derivative. And there's this thing called the chain rule that, that I'm sure you all, um, everybody that knows calculus will remember. And so we say that it changes like this, right? Times t dot. Times p dot. Times L dot times NT dot, and I'm not gonna write the other two, okay? And since we said that our system is gonna be in contact with a thermal reservoir, right, which is the, 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 the air in this room, that means the temper, you know, we're, we're in a good lab, you know, we're in like a NCBS or something like that, it's a very, very good lab. And so the temperature is well controlled, it doesn't change over time, we can forget about it, okay? The pressure, same. I mean, atmospheric pressure is it's kind of hard to beat, so it doesn't change. And okay, so that's, that's, that's the good part of doing calculus when you, seem, you, know, you can put things to zero, right? And so we have uh, these other terms, and now we're gonna do a very physics-y thing, which is just give things different names. Okay, so we're gonna call, um, Partial G, partial L is just uh, the, the force that this thing is sustaining. And partial G, partial NI is um, chemical potential. And uh, it's more subtle than this, right? You need to, but more or less. Okay, so I think this already shows you that some, and, and Ni is the different chemicals, right? So Ni, where I can be ADP, ATP, ADP, or PI, okay? Very simple, it could be very simple. So I think that like this, you can already see some symmetry in this problem, right? If you wanna talk about energetics, about changing free energy, there's some, some symmetry here, right? And the symmetry is that you have this thing, which is some kind of force, multiplied by this thing, and the rate of change of this quantity. And then you have this thing, which is a chemical potential, multiplied by this thing, the rate of change of this quantity. This quantity is number of particles. This quantity is distance. It's okay. Different quantities, same idea. So in that sense, you can see that somehow the chemical potential is a bit like a force. It's a bit like the, the force of chemistry, okay? 
you have several forces, of course, right? one per, per component, but we see that, that, that you need to do some kind of force balance, okay? Now the, the next, just interrupt me if you have any questions, okay? So far so good, everybody? And again, about the mathematical and thermodynamic details, uh, uh, I, I, there's people that know much more than me in the audience, so we can go to them. <laughs> but but you know, you can interrupt me, of course. So then you need to re remember uh, this, the, uh, what will happen is that the, there will be a hydrolysis reaction, right? And then there, there's something very simple that you have to keep in mind, which is some kind of, is that every time, so let's put it another way. What needs to happen for an ADP to, to um, appear in the system, an ADP molecule, right? What needs to happen on this side of the, there's only one way in which ADP molecules will appear. Hydrolysis, right? So that means uh, one of these guys needs to disappear. Okay, so that means if you, I'm gonna be a bit loose with what dn means and all that. I guess if dn, uh, and the same for the water, right? So the only way, and whenever you have a new ADP appearing, you also have a new inorganic phosphate appearing. You have one of these guys and one of these guys disappearing, okay? Equals one. Then uh, the other two I said minus one, then the other two will equal one, okay? So what this means is that we don't need to keep track of all these terms. We in fact only really, there's only really one of them, right? There's one rate of change. This is how much this reaction is happening, okay? And that's it, and if you know, this guy uh, disappear, you know, ATP disappear, three ATPs disappear, then you know, as well as three of these disappear and three of this and this appear. That's it, so in reality, you only have one variable. So it's, it's so things are a bit easier than maybe we were expecting. And so that means we can write, um, rate of change of the free energy as the force times this thing plus the chemical potentials, right? So each of these will have a chemical potential, but now we only need to keep track of one of these variables. So we just need to write um, and I may be off by signs. I should say that uh, already, but I'm sure under some sign convention, this is correct. Okay, does that make sense? What, what happened here, right? It's very, 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 very innocent. So we can rewrite this. Oh, a question. not so innocent, okay. So um, uh, just the uh, H2O wasn't in the D function. Oh, okay. I, I, I thought you might have um, assumed it was like a background constant because there's so many more of them. Yeah, that? yeah, you can, you can, yes. Uh, but then you've included it here. As I said, is I'm it, being a bit necessary? loose. So you can uh, remove it here, remove it there. Then you have to be a bit careful with how you define the free energies of ATP. That, that, that's all. You can remove it. You prefer. Simpler equation. Um, and normally we call this delta mu ATP uh, times. Um, N dot ATP, okay? And this is the thing that if you keep track of all the chemical potentials properly, will be the often repeated quantity of 25 uh, KBT, okay? And this thing needs to be negative, right? The rate of free energy changes will be negative by the second law of thermodynamics.
Okay, so, so there's another way of, of, of thinking about uh, this equation. Uh, 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 you can define this as a velocity. You can define this as um, a reaction velocity, the rate of change of a reaction if you want. And then you can just um, do something like Times V. Oh, I think just to agree with my notes, I'll put this here. Um, times R, okay? And and uh, again, you, you see here the, the symmetry, right? The, 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 the structure of this equation, where there's this force times a velocity, and this is some kind of rate of a reaction times a, a, a force, or a force, but a sum of all forces, if you want, a net force, okay? And this is often, uh, uh, so you will often hear that to write the, the dissipation rate, you need to write something like um, uh, forces times fluxes, okay? So these are the fluxes here, these are the forces. Is it more or less clear? Okay. So this is again a very simple example, uh, derived in a not very formal way, okay? <laughs> that hopefully gives you the right intuition, right? So if you want to calculate the rate of free energy dissipation, you need to do a sum of all the forces times fluxes. Okay. So how does um, energy transduction happen in this system? <laughs> to see that a bit better, let me change. What do I change? So normally one refers to this as minus the external force. And the idea here is that you think of a muscle or normally a single molecule. You, know, you do a kinesin walking on a microtubule type of experiment and you will attach a bead. So many of you have heard kinesin, right? You, you're probably familiar with this type of setup where you have a track, you have this is kinesin and it has a a bead that people draw like this, when reality is like humongous, right? And this is trapped, you know, look, since I have colors, a laser, laser beam, right? And this laser beam, you know, in some sense, behaves like a hook and spring, okay? And we like exert a force on the motor. Meanwhile, the motor is performing, you know, putting ATP, ADP, Okay, so normally you refer to this as the external force. Okay, and this is just sort of a macroscopic way of thinking. You could have a muscle and just be exerting some force on it. Um, and so the power dissipated, you know, is minus the free energy loss. So it's a positive quantity. You can write it as some term, some mechanical work, as some chemical work, where this would be, um, so my, you know, this term. It would be this term. And when, and this has to be positive. Okay. So normally, when we talk about mechanochemical transduction by simple motors, what, we're, what we mean is that there will be, if you assume that delta mu ATP. Okay, so, so let me put it another way. You have different regimes of operation of this system. Okay, different regimes in which this can work. And one regime is what we, would, we call a chemical motor. And in the chemical motor regime, you're gonna have the velocity, if you have the velocity positive, and mu ATP is 
positive, right, under physiological conditions, you can have the mechanical work being negative. Okay, when the mechanical work is negative, this means that the external force will be negative, so it's opposing the motion. Okay, so you're extract, so, so, so this is performing work on the outside. But it's okay because the chemical work will be positive and large enough so that in the end, you have that the power dissipated is positive. So that's what people mean by mechanochemical transduction. You see, you have this thing is negative. Okay, so it's per, the motor is performing work. So this thing, if you want to see, opposes the, the second law, right? So this has to be positive, yet you have a term that is negative, and that's a mechanical term, okay? Yet that's okay, because you have another term, which is positive and bigger, which is a chemical term. Therefore, this thing is working as a molecular motor, so to speak. Is that more or less clear? You look suspicious. You. <laughs> so the, the force will, of course, depend on L itself. On dg over dl will depend on it will depend on l itself so i guess you will have a certain length for a, a certain length such that you have uh, g you mean eventually this thing will stretch so much that you 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 can't um, on l no on, on on the opposite there will be an equilibrium condition in which in which you have the, 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 the perfect line, such a so, so that the, the, the chemical reaction either right, right, right. Eventually, this chemical, so, so if, you, if you're not powering this with external reservoirs, right, eventually this will equilibrate, mm -hmm. right? So you, you, yeah, you have so much, so, so that's a good point, right? So eventually, if you're, not, if you're not sustaining this by giving more and more ATP to the system, what will happen? Uh, that there will be so much, well, all ATP will be hydrolyzed, there will be so much ADP that will be more likely to happen is that the reaction happens in, in reverse. Right? Uh, in practical matters, uh, I don't know how much these reactions happen in reverse. Probably mostly you just hydrolyze all ATP and it never really happens in the reverse because the kinetic barrier is probably huge. Right? Although one can reverse this, this uh, uh, systems. And also another comment. Um, so in, in, in many systems you have, uh, of course, the hydrolysis that drives this mechanical work. Uh, so th there can be the case, uh, the example uh, before of uh, uh, the ATP synthase in which the mechanical, the mechanical work is forced by the, by, by the proton flux. And in which case it, it will then correspond to a reaction that is in the opposite direction of the one that would be the spontaneous one. Right, so, th so this is correct, right? So in the, uh, so uh, I mean, so the, the question is, well, here you're saying that it's hydrolyzing ATP, but ATP synthesis works differently. So ATP synthesis is a very, very interesting and, uh, system, right? First, it's in, in bacteria, it's, um, I mean, it's always reversible, right? but in bacteria, it's functionally reversible. But under normal conditions, what happens is that uh, there's a proton flux. It's like two coupled molecular motors in some sense. Okay, so one is the, the one that runs by protons. But if you remove that part, then you just have the upper part it, this will also behave like a motor moving in the other direction. And so for the case of the ATP synthase, the proton gradient, there is a, 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 an ATP gradient. Okay, so how do I, let me draw it here, right? So it's a bit like this. So you have your ATP, your, your membrane, and you have um, right, so, he, so here, uh, delta mu ATP, so this is outside, this is inside. So here, delta mu ATP is positive, right? So as you say, uh, in principle, this, according to what I said, it should just hydrolyze it and move. And it does that sometimes, right? It does that when you're not powering uh, uh, protons through here, right? But you're powering protons so, the, 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 the gradient of protons is so large 
that this is favorable. And then in doing that, this will run in reverse, essentially. So the nor under normal circumstances, under one, okay, so when, the, when respiration is active, it happens in, as an ATP, it, it operates as a synthesis, ATP synthesis protein. When respiration doesn't happen, in fact, that's what you said, right? And it acts as a proton pump, it pushes pumps out, uh, protons out because the electron transport chain, it's a fun thing, right? The electron transport chain is not pushing out the protons anymore. So somebody needs to do it. So aha, you got lucky. The ATP synthesis can do it itself. Okay, so. yeah, there, there was some, uh, no, okay. Yes, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, I was thinking a little about the length scale. Um, so when, when, would, when you say L, do you mean the sort of length scale of a single molecule of the motor? Well, well here, I, I've been very vague, right? So, so, so here, I just mean this is a, so this is a macroscopic description. Okay. Okay, so here I'm assuming this is like a chunk of a muscle or something. In principle, you can do a, a, a microscopic description and, and do something very similar to this, not exactly like this, um, for a single molecule. And in that case, the length would be something like, um, um, it's a good question, probably the, 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 so you would talk about, you would consider it probably an anonic equivalent steady state, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's moving, right? And normally you would talk about the velocity more than the length. So it would be somehow like the position, the, the length would simply be something like the position with some reference, right? So you would say the motor is walking on a lattice or something, right? There's a microtubule lattice, tick, 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 tick. And you say, well, the change in the position of the motor over time, that's the velocity, right? And what you would have is uh, then the, the fun thing, right? That, that Simone wrote a very nice book about, I invite everybody to buy. <laughs> Uh, is that there would be fluctuations, right? Because this is a very small system, so sometimes motors backstep, right? Sometimes they stop a bit longer than they should, right? So everything is stochastic, right? Here I'm just doing standard macroscopic thermodynamics. This is the 60s, 60s, 70s. Um, any more comments, questions? One common question. But like what the force means. Um, so like if you have, um, usually in biology, we have like force dipoles that are formed. And this is sort of like an external net force, right? This is not. Okay, so you can imagine, yes. So now what does the force mean, right? I, I guess uh, in, in, in this system, it's, it's pretty clear, no? So you mean more in this system. I guess you, you, have, you, you have to, you know, <laughs> I drew it close to here because I was almost tempted, but I didn't do it, but to put this as if it were attached to one wall. And then you have to imagine that somebody has like a, a spring or something and it's pulling from the other side, right? And so this will be performing a force against uh, whatever mechanical system you have coupled to it. Where that force is a constant, so we can write yes. down. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so here the, the, the right, so you, you have conjugate variables, L and F, mm -hmm. right? So while your, the, your variable here is L, mm -hmm. and then if you want to have a control parameter, it would be the conjugate. And, and oh, sorry, one last thing. And if you want to put the dynamics of uh, ATP, ADP, then the N dot will have to take into account the equilibrium constant, concentrations. So the, 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 so if you want to put the dynamics of ATP, ADP, uh, as opposed to this sort of simple yep. uh, steady states. So if, if, if you don't, if you don't, so, okay. So if you, Normally, what you would do is you would couple, you would do a conjugate variables here, and you would tether the values of ATP and ADP to some the, the to their chemical potential, right? So the concentrations, the molecules can be constantly exchanged with the reservoir. You keep the chemical potentials constant, and that's how the system can be sustained arbitrarily long. Right? Otherwise, you need to keep track of the chemical reactions that are happening there too over time, right? Yeah. More comments, questions? Okay, so we only have 20 minutes left, which is okay. So maybe I'll just skip. We're gonna say something about other Sager and whatever, but we can leave that. And maybe I'll just give you a, a brief feeling of, of um, another example. Uh, so this is mechanochemical transduction. 
right? So how you somehow use chemical energy to do mechanical work, right? I'm not gonna talk about the metabolism part. So maybe I have 20 minutes to explain something that I did with Simone many years ago. <laughs> that's doable. Um, and that, that's one example in which you have, um, uh, you could say signaling or information processing in the cell and you couple chemical energy to information processing. Okay. Yes. Sir, so how that laser uh, is acting as a hooking spring? Is it because of the intense? <coughs> I think it has to do with the refractive index of the of the uh, glass bead. So, so essentially, I think the glass bead that you attach uh, uh, wants to stay in the in the uh, where you're placing the laser because of some difference in refractive index. I'm not an expert on this, but uh, maybe Shashi, you know better. No, well, I don't know. So it's like the, 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 the reason the bead stays in place and exerts a force is because of the change in refractive index between the glass and the air for the laser, right? Yeah, I think one simple way to think about this is just a ray optics picture where the refraction of light will cause change in momentum, of the photons, and therefore there's a force acting on the bead. And that's the reason why the bead is held in place. Mm -hmm. And if the bead displaces to the right or the left, um, we can discuss this later in the board, but it, it so transpires that there will be a restoring force. And that's why it's called a trap. And that's why you can think of it like a spring. Yeah. Or you can also sometimes have a constant force ensemble, exactly. right? You and can you have, move yeah. your laser with the bead, but at a certain we distance. We can discuss so. the details of that on the board. OK, so let me. Okay, so, so this is some, some uh, minimal flavor of uh, energy transduction, of mechanochemical transduction. There's a, so what I told you is sort of a mixed, well, I think this is mostly in this, in this uh, textbook. You can also, uh, uh, my PhD advisor, Frank Yuli here, also has a very nice review. And I think the, the, the best part of the review is probably the, the, the you know, there's one, one section at the beginning where something like this is done. Uh, uh, um, maybe a bit more, more advanced. So they talk about on saga relations and so on that uh, I thought about saying a couple of words, but maybe another, another time. Um, right, because, uh, okay, so what you can imagine essentially, maybe I'll just say with words is that if you don't have, if your chemical potential is set to, is if delta mu ATP is set to zero, then the system will not be able to do um, so do without equations, the system it will not be able to do mechanical work because if this is negative, then you would be violating the second law, right? So therefore, as you increase the chemical potential, you can start doing mechanical work, right? So in that sense, you have this trade-off. At this scale, is everything is linear, very simple, right? Eventually becomes non-linear and, and and hard to understand. And of course, in the in the cell, you can't expect this this linear relationships to make much. Uh, much sense, but um, okay. 16 minutes. Let's do it. So the the pretty sure I don't need all these pages. The 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 other topic that I said was information processing and how energy couples with information processing, right? So that's that's actually probably the well. I mean, I worked on a bit on both, right? So on Celia, we talked about energy transaction, but I also worked on on this aspect of information processing. And in particular, we, uh, one of the works that we did in this, uh, did in this direction was, was with Simone and, and had to do with the relationship between trying to understand what happens when you're, when you have, when, you're, when a cell is, is, is copying information. Okay, so you can have, Maybe let's call this P or something. Okay, so the, the idea is, is very simple. You have, uh, yeah, I, I didn't go, uh, so I skipped a little bit on the topic of uh, transcription, translation, and DNA duplication. Okay, but I think you, you, you we've already covered it a couple of times. The basic idea is that cells need to copy information in order to function, right? So they need to transcribe their DNA into messenger RNA, and then they need to translate that into 
into an amino acid sequence so that it falls and becomes a protein, it does something, right? And also important, uh, they need to, they need to um, copy their own DNA, duplicate their own DNA in order to, to you know, have progeny and, and so on, right? And the question that Simone and I were interested in is, well, there's there several aspects that are important for that to happen. Clearly, you, the speed is important, right? So you probably want this process to be fast. In particular, the case of DNA duplication may end up becoming a bottleneck for cell division under some conditions, right? And, and, and see, I can promote against Simone. It's a very nice work on understanding uh, that aspect, right? So in fact, the, the you know, cells, uh, you know, there's a whole story on how uh, E. coli doesn't have the time to wait until actually having, uh, uh, you know, essentially it starts dividing uh, its DNA even before it starts uh, uh, replicating. I don't know if that's uh, the right way to say it. It has more than two DNA copies when it replicates. Maybe that's the right way to say it. Um, okay, so, so speed very important, right? But it is also important to have a certain level of accuracy. Okay, so if you copy too fast, you may be prone to make mistakes. If you make too many mistakes, then uh, you may have uh, deleterious mutations. If you have deleterious mutations, that's, that's bad. Right? The cell doesn't grow, doesn't infect people. Um, on the other hand, and this is something that we never really talked about in our paper, you don't want this to be zero either, right? Because you want to evolve. So to evolve, you need to have some level of mutation, so some kind of limit to how accurate you want to be. And I think that the, maybe the most beautiful thing to say about this is the the, the introduction of a, of a classic paper by a, by a, by a person called uh, John Hopfield, right, who has on some of the main contributions to biology about discussing the error. Right? So I'm gonna talk about that. But before, the, the main concept is how, you know, what happens here, right? So how, is, how are these curves? So do you become more accurate as you reduce your error? Right? So do you have something like this? No, you become more accurate as you go faster, right? So maybe you have something like, like this, or the other way around. As you go faster, your error rate increases, right? And how does that relate with this axis, right? With dissipation. So how do these three things couple together, right? Because energy is also important, right? You may want to be uh, energy efficient. So what um, John Hopfield uh, uh, noticed is that there's a very simple calculation you can do to uh, convince you that there's something interesting going on behind this process, right? So he was thinking about a setup like, like this. I'm gonna simplify it, right? Where you have, um, you know, where you have some kind of, let's do one more and then here, some kind of polymerase. Okay, it's moving at a certain speed. I already defined variables. And it has a certain error rate that I defined as eta, right? And of course, and this corresponds to the one copy of DNA, and this corresponds to your template of DNA, and this is your copy that should go to the next, uh, the next cell, no? These things are interacting. What he estimated was what should be the error rate that you would expect. Right? So here you made a correct copy, right? You had a, the, 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 the white circle and you put another white circle, right? Here you have green, green, so it's okay. White, white, and here you have white, green, right? So this is wrong, it's a mistake. So you have a mistake, right, right, right. So pretty good, you know. Now what he did is uh, estimate the chances that this happens, okay? So he estimated the chances that this happens saying, well, I know the energy of this bond. This is an unfavorable bond. It has one less uh, hydrogen bond when you make a, a mistake. Okay. This have two or three hydrogen bonds for DNA. Uh, this I think has one, okay? So we know the, the delta G, the energy, content of an error, essentially, is the difference between making the correct bond and the wrong bond, okay? And then you can go to this website, by your numbers, right? And you can look what the difference between these binding energies 
bending energies uh, is, it turns out to be something like 8 kT. Okay? And then he used a bit of statistical physics magic right? <laughs> and trust. He said, well, um, at equilibrium, the error should be something like, you know, more or less, the, well, at perfect equilibrium should be, yeah, that, but something rough as it is, as the exponential of minus eight. Okay? There's, now realize that I don't know if you know statistical physics, but is this something that makes sense to most of you at least? Not to you, this I, I presume, but <laughs> you require some time to, to explain. Are, are you most of you okay with that? Yeah, so, so the idea is that this is like the, the, the probability of an error, right? So we know from, from statistical physics, the probability of something to happen, right? So the probability of an error is somehow like e to minus the energy, or let's say in this case, the free energy of the error, right? This is a classical statistical physics thing. And so he applied it and he did that. And the number he got to uh, was, um, the number you get is about 10 to the minus four. And he said, aha, we have, we're, we're, in, we're in business because in fact, the, the number that you uh, observe for DNA duplication, the error rate is extremely low compared to this. And so the, the real number is, um, I think something like 10 to the minus 10 maybe. Depends, 10 to the minus nine, 10, right? Okay. So he said, well, um, it's clear what happened, right? So, so what happens here? We have enough time that, that, that we can, seven minutes is okay. So who has a, a guess of, of why this estimate failed? The answer is, is, is very simple. It requires somebody to rage us. Like John was in the 70s. System is not at equilibrium, right? So why should this hold? System is not at equilibrium. There's no reason why this should hold. So we said, well, then it's very not at equilibrium. It must be very not at equilibrium. And, and there's something that this non-equilibrium is doing that presumably has to do with error reduction. And then in this uh, beautiful uh, introduction to his paper said, wouldn't it be nice, you know, <laughs> if you could just uh, proofread, okay? you could just check your mistakes. If you, if you proofread, he said, so if you, if you do um, what he called kinetic proofreading, right? So if, well, let's just call it proofreading. Right? Then you will have uh, double the error. I mean, uh, uh, the error. you have the, the, the square of the term that you got. Right? You, the probability of making an error, and then you check again, right? And then you go, right? And so you say, well, at least that gives me like something like 10 to the minus eight. And given how rough I've been with everything, that may have the, the right idea, the right flavor, right? I think this is one of the aha moments <laughs> in the history of biophysics, right? Because you see, you start with a very simple estimate. You realize it doesn't make sense. And then you said, ah, but the, the square of that will be the right thing. And then I just need to double check things, right? And so essentially what, what was proposed was a out of equilibrium mechanism such that you can check your errors, right? So you have to an enzyme, whatever, you know, I mean, the, the molecular details are very intricate, but they, they don't matter so much. Yeah. Right, so, 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 so what is, it, what is it, the, the, the idea, right? So what he was saying is, uh, um, let me elaborate a bit on, on, on what I mean here. So what he was saying is, if, you're, if you have a certain, say, look, I cannot make bonds, that, you know, I cannot make up more hydrogen bonds or charge their binding energy. That's, it is what it is, right? In the end, there, this, this 8 kT, that's what I have to discriminate. But he said, but if I, do it, if I do it twice, then the probability of the error happening is the probability of the error happening twice. So the probability of happening the first time, which has 10 to the minus four, times the probability of happening a second time, which is again 10 to the minus four. He said, well, the probability of that happening is very, very little, it's 10 to the minus eight. But for that, I need to somehow go on a, on a loop, you know, and double check everything that I did. It's like you try to copy something, and then you try to copy it again uh, um, 
without looking at the first one. So even if you have always the same accuracy of copying, you're copying it twice, and only you know, and that will reduce your your error. Right? And so he introduced a molecular mechanism, okay, which he referred to as kinetic proofreading. where um, um, this would happen. Now, it's not so important whether the molecular details of what he proposed are correct. I actually don't know, probably they're not for the case of DNA duplication, but um, um, the idea is what's important. Right? So the idea prevailed. And in fact, I think that must be one of the, well, I won't say few, but one of the not too many cases in which uh, physics theoretical concept, I think has quite, strongly permeated uh, biological literature, right? So people talk about proofreading, error correction, and genetic proofreading and all that, right? And, and of course, now we, we can do much more careful experiments. So I don't know the case of DNA duplication, but for example, for translation, right? So for protein translation, there's very careful experiments being, that have been done in, in, in Denmark, I think, the group of Mans Ehrenberg, and Sweden, Sweden, whatever. <laughs> Um, um, and uh, where he, he uh, well, he, he can actually measure these relationships that we're talking about, right? So how does the error rate change with the speed, you know, and how does the dissipation understood as the chemical driving of the, right? He, he does a little this, right? Changes with the, with the speed and so on. And furthermore, the molecular details now are understood, right? So of course, for the case of the ribosome, for example, it's much more complicated than this. It doesn't have well, I didn't even show you what kinetic proofreading is, but it's like a two-step process. But in the case of the ribosome, it's like seven steps or whatever, right? So it's very, very intricate. Some of those steps you can interpret as a proofreading step. Others use other types of discrimination by simply having the forward rates be different, right? I don't think I'm gonna have in two minutes and a half time to, <laughs> to explain that idea, but the, the main idea, but, but um, um, you can discriminate not only by uh, kinetic proofreading, but also just by having a reaction in which the forward rates are different. Right? So equilibrium means that the binding energies are different, but if you just do things faster the right way, uh, as long as you're fast, it's okay, right? And that's more or less what, what uh, Simone and I did. And a bit the, the answer to this original question, which again, helps to touch with this, um, idea that is not very clear what you should put in there, right? Uh, it depends. So there's different ways of obtaining different curves. You, have, you can have curves, so you can have regimes, which in fact, to reduce the error, you need to go very fast. Um, but that's a very dissipative regime. So that exists, right? You can also achieve the same accuracy at very little energetic cost. However, then you will have to go very slow. So you see, there's not something like a universal curve that you put here. It will depend on the details of your system, right? And if you want to map a specific biological system, of course, you need to do a very specific uh, model, right? But the ideas, the general ideas um, prevail. Any more uh, comments? Yeah. Uh, does, the, does the fact that the system is not at equilibrium affect the free energy calculation or not? Uh, I'm sorry, can you say it again? So the, the fact that the system is at non-equilibrium, does it affect the free energy? I just, I just don't know. So in the end, once, uh, uh, so it won't affect this, this, this term, right? In the end, once the system has passed, this is essentially bonded. And there's a certain equilibrium bond, a certain strength of this bond that is, you know, nothing in the cell is really at equilibrium, but it is at equilibrium. What, what is non-equilibrium is the process by which you create that bond, right? So essentially, imagine this is a little, this is a little machine, right? So this is not just, I mean, in some sense, the estimate he did didn't make any sense <laughs> because that would be what you would expect if this wasn't, was almost doing nothing, right? And you just let it, you know, just let the bases bind by themselves, right? You're like, I mean, we know, I mean, there's this whole thing in there, right? probably consuming energy. I mean, it must be doing something, right? So what it's doing is, is, is trying to do better than just equilibrium binding, right? With different tricks, right? So in some sense, the process, you, you could say that the process of, um, of um, oh, we're out of time. Uh, you could say that the process of, of, of um, let me just finish the, the sentence, of binding the, the monomer, 
Okay, so from when you go uh, from having something like, um, I just finish this sentence that I'm gone. Okay, so we had a cartoon was like this, right? And here we have bonds that exist. Here we have a machine. Okay, so from going to here to um, the outcome, which is something like either this, and then we did the right thing. And then the machine moves on to the next one here. Right? Or um, this, and you made a mistake. And then the machine moves on somewhere here. So if we're going from here to here, there can be many sub-steps. Right? And these sub-steps can consume energy. And that can help you. I mean, of course, the simplest model, you just have something like this, right? And already with that, you can, you can play, right? Which uh, I didn't tell you about, but that, that's what we did. But in principle, this is not just like that. It will you know, have a complicated set of states that your system will transition to until you get there. And that can help you, OK? So we're over time, I think. We can continue the questions uh, uh, outside, in case some people don't want to listen. <laughs> yeah. Any pressing questions right now before we go to the break? <laughs>